In 1968, a young woman in her 20s was with her mother at a motel in Atlanta when a policeman suddenly knocked on their front door. The policeman said something that made her mother couldn't help but open the door, but she didn't know that she had made a mistake by opening the door. Today's story will probably sound like it came out of a movie, but this is a story that actually happened more than 50 years ago. This is the story of the kidnapping of Barbara Mackle. In 1968, Barbara Mackle was listed as a senior student at Emory University, one of the oldest universities in Georgia, United States. But Barbara was no ordinary college student. Her father, Robert, was a wealthy developer in Miami, where his companies, which he and his two brothers owned, were valued at about $65 million. As an only child, of course, Barbara will inherit her father's wealth and companies one day. But before that happens, she must go to college first, and she chooses Emory University as the place where she studies. Everything went smoothly for her at first, but in 1968, just as Christmas was approaching, the Hong Kong flu epidemic swept the world, and the United States was no exception. At that time, many students at Emory were affected by the disease, resulting in hospital rooms in Atlanta is full of patients. Then on December 13, 1968, Barbara's parents got the bad news that she also had the disease. And so Jane, her mother, rushed from her home in Coral Gables to Atlanta by car, hoping she could nurse Barbara well before taking her home for Christmas in Florida. But of course Jane will not take care of Barbara around campus, which is being hit by the Hong Kong flu, so she decides to take Barbara to a nearby motel where she can focus on recovering from her condition. Barbara and Jane then stayed at the motel for the next few days, until on December 16, Barbara's boyfriend Stuart Hunt Woodward visited to check on her condition. He spent a few hours with the mother and daughter before heading home in the evening to give Barbara time to rest. Barbara continued to sleep well past midnight when she awoke with a high temperature. Realizing that her daughter had a fever again, Jane then took care of her while accompanying her to talk. They were so absorbed in their conversation that they didn't notice that it was already four in the morning. And that's when they heard a knock on the front door. Both Jane and Barbara wondered who knocked on their door early this morning, but then Jane thought this could be important, so she walked to the door and asked who was there. The man behind the door claims to be a cop, and he tells Jane and Barbara that Stuart, Barbara's boyfriend, has just been in a traffic accident. Concern immediately overtook Jane when she heard the news, and without the slightest suspicion, she opened the door to ask the officer further. But to her surprise, as soon as she opened the door, she found that the person in front of her was not a police officer. The man was wearing a mask while holding a shotgun in his hand, and not far behind him, a smaller person was wearing a ski mask. With just a glance at the appearance of the two, Jane realized that if she didn't close the door quickly, she and Barbara would be in danger. But sadly, before she could do anything, the two masked men burst into the room and, brandishing their guns, threatened Barbara and Jane not to make a sound. Then after making sure the mother and daughter wouldn't fight them, they tied Jane with a rope and then covered her face with a handkerchief that had been poured with chloroform to knock her out. But Jane wasn't the person they were after. Their target was Barbara, who they then forced into their car a blue Volvo. Sometime later, Jane woke up, and the first thing she did was try desperately to untie the ropes that bound her. She finally managed to free herself and called the police, but by the time the police arrived at the motel, Barbara and her captors were long gone. Her captors took Barbara to a remote pine forest about 20 miles from the motel. They then parked their car at the forest's edge, forced Barbara down, and dragged her into the woods. They continued walking for about 15 minutes until they arrived in front of a hole that seemed to have been prepared beforehand, and in that hole was a fiberglass box shaped like a coffin. The kidnappers then told Barbara to get into the box, which scared her instantly. She cries, begging them to spare her life, and even swears that she will do whatever they want as long as they don't kill her or tell her to enter the box. But that is precisely what the kidnappers want. They demanded Barbara climb into the box and then lie down in it. They promised to let her live if she did what they said. Thus, having no other choice, Barbara did exactly what they asked. She complied when the kidnappers told her to smile while holding a handwritten sign that read kidnapped. Even when the kidnappers took her photo, she still complied. But what happened next really scared her terribly. The kidnappers closed the box and screwed up the top. Then a few seconds later, they started filling the hole with soil. Barbara could clearly hear the sound of dirt hitting the box. She screamed as soon as she heard the sound, begging them to let her go. But the kidnappers paid no heed to her screams. They kept shoveling dirt and filling the two feet deep hole until Barbara couldn't hear anything anymore. 
everything went silent. At this moment, Barbara screamed again. She continued screaming, hitting and kicking the box for several hours afterward, but help never arrived. Exhausted, Barbara finally stopped screaming. She realized there was nothing she could do in a situation like this, but on the other hand, she knew that she wouldn't die in that box and even imagined that she would celebrate Christmas with her family. Her kidnappers didn't want her to die either. They had provided the box with enough food and drink for a week, a blanket, a sweater, sanitary equipment, a fan, a lamp, and two ventilation tubes that connected the box to the ground, allowing air from outside to enter. On top of that, they gave her a long note about how she could survive there using the equipment. On the same note, they also tell her that they will release her no later than Christmas. She was kidnapped on December 17th, meaning the kidnappers expected her to spend eight days in the box. But still, despite all the equipment, we can't forget that the kidnappers had buried Barbara alive, which is very cruel and inhumane. Plus, the kidnappers didn't ensure they provided her with a good lamp. Only about three hours after she entered the crib, the lamp broke, leaving her to spend her days in complete darkness. Meanwhile, at around 9 a.m., just a few hours after Barbara was kidnapped, her father, Robert, received a letter from the kidnappers. In the letter, they demanded Robert give them a ransom of $500,000 if he wanted Barbara returned to him safely and he was given a week to prepare. More specifically, Robert had to prepare the ransom in $20 bills with random and unordered serial numbers, which were put in a large suitcase. And when Robert has managed to raise the money, he should place an ad in the Miami Herald that reads, Loved one, please come home. We will pay all expenses and meet you anywhere at any time. Your family. Then a few hours after the ransom message arrived, the Mackles residents received a package containing Barbara's necklace and a photo of her holding the kidnapped sign. Seeing these things, Robert and Jane increasingly worried about their daughter's safety. So without wasting any more time, Robert quickly prepared the money according to the kidnappers' instructions, which resulted in the FBI having to field a team of 25 people to count the piles of $20 bills, and they had to do it overnight. The next day on December 18th, they had finished counting the money and put it in a large suitcase. Also, that same day, Robert put the ad in the paper with the same words as the kidnappers had asked for. The kidnappers had deliberately ordered Robert to place the advertisement so they would know that he was ready to hand over the ransom. So as soon as they saw the ad, they called Robert and instructed him to go alone to a bridge southeast of where he lived the following day. That's where he had to put the ransom they asked for. The next day at about 4 a.m. on December 19th, Robert drove alone to the agreed point and then put the money in the suitcase. He didn't stay there for long and returned home soon after, hoping the kidnappers would contact him again when they had taken the money. He never thought something unexpected would happen after he left. At around 5 a.m., the local police patrolling the area accidentally spotted the two kidnappers while they were carrying the suitcase. The cops knew nothing about Barbara's kidnapping, nor did they know about the ransom that Robert had placed there. On the other hand, the two kidnappers thought the police would arrest them, so they threw down everything they were carrying and ran into the forest. After Robert and Jane found out about the incident, they were worried that the kidnappers would become angry and mistakenly thought Robert had been trying to trap them. In particular, Robert and Jane feared that the kidnappers would kill Barbara because of the incident. Robert was so worried that he put an ad in the paper to tell the kidnappers that he had no involvement with the Miami police showing up at the scene. In the same ad, he begs the kidnappers to contact him again and promises to do whatever they ask as long as they free Barbara. Fortunately, the kidnappers read the ad and they immediately contacted Robert. This time they instructed Robert to deposit the ransom on the Tamiami Trail, which is just west of his residence, at 1 a.m. on December 20th. So once again, Robert drove alone to carry out their instructions. This second attempt went well. The kidnappers managed to take the money without any problems and left the drop-off point. But this doesn't mean that Robert and Jane can breathe a sigh of relief. They still had to wait for news from the kidnappers regarding where they were holding Barbara. They kept waiting and waiting, and it was only after 12 hours of waiting that one of the kidnappers contacted the FBI office in Atlanta about the location of Barbara's burial. Turns out she was buried in the woods near Duluth, Georgia. So with that information, more than 100 FBI agents assisted by the local police combed every inch of the forest to find Barbara. And after several hours of searching, two FBI agents found the ventilation pipes at about 4 p.m. So they immediately reported the discovery to the other agents and the police, and soon they all started digging around the area with their bare hands and minimal equipment. They kept digging without stopping until they saw the box. 
On the afternoon of December 20th, Barbara Mackle was finally found after spending about 83 hours buried underground. She was found dehydrated and had lost about 10 pounds, but apart from that, she was not injured. She was even more worried about her parents than herself. In fact, the first words that came out of her mouth when she was found were, Are my parents okay? Shortly after she is found, Barbara is flown on Robert's private jet to Miami, where she is reunited with her family, who rejoice at her return. On December 24, 1968, President Nixon even stopped by the Mackles to congratulate Barbara on her safe return. With Barbara found, the FBI is now focusing all their attention on catching her kidnappers. The kidnappers had, in fact, abandoned their car when they failed to take the ransom money away on the first try, and after examining the car, the FBI managed to find the fingerprints of the two kidnappers. In addition, they found a photo of Barbara in the glove of the car as well as information about the two kidnappers. It didn't take long for FBI agents to identify the kidnappers. The first is Gary Stephen Christ, a 23-year-old man who has been in and out of prison many times. In fact, at that time, Christ was a fugitive after he escaped from prison for car theft in California. While the second suspect is Ruth Eisenman Skier, a student from Honduras who received a scholarship from her country to take a master's degree in marine biology at the University of Miami. She is indeed an intelligent woman and even speaks four languages, which are Spanish, English, German, and French. But for some reason, she agrees to join in on her boyfriend Christ's plan to make quick money by kidnapping a woman and demanding ransom from her family. But after they managed to get a ransom from Robert, Christ and Skier split up. Although, Skier ended up proving to be more shrewd at evading tracking, because on December 22nd, the police found Christ riding a motorboat he bought with a small part of the ransom. At first, he planned to escape by following the river path to Fort Myers before moving north. But as police boats and helicopters continued to chase him, he was forced to pull over and abandon his boat before running away on foot into the mangroves on Hog Island. His efforts, however, ended in vain. After 12 hours of the siege on the island, the FBI and the police managed to catch Christ, and along with his arrest, they found $17,000 in his clothes pocket and $480,000 in the boat he left behind. The boat itself was bought by Christ for $2,240, which means $760 in cash is missing. While Christ was arrested five days after the kidnapping, Skier was only caught 79 days later in Oklahoma. She had lived a sedentary life since she separated from Christ and even looked destitute when she was arrested. In the end, Skier was sentenced to seven years in prison, although she argued that she participated in Christ's crimes because of her love for him. But within just four years of her sentence, she was released on parole and deported to Honduras. As for Christ, it was known from his interrogation that he had been planning to kidnap Barbara Mackle for a long time. He even compiled a list of 100 women who could be kidnapped before finally choosing Barbara, who he judged fit the profile he expected. According to his parole officer, Christ is looking for a rich, tough-minded female, someone who could stand up to the trauma of being buried alive. Then after he sets Barbara as his target, he starts stalking and learning all about her and her family, including her relationship with Stuart Woodward. On top of that, he prepared the whole a few days before the kidnapping. At the trial, the prosecutor demanded Christ receive the death penalty for his crimes, but in the end he only got a life sentence, probably because of Barbara's testimony. She didn't want him to be put to death because, as her memoir says, it was Christ who contacted the FBI and told them her location so they could free her. But Christ ended up not spending the rest of his life in prison because, after 10 years, he was released on parole. As for Barbara, she married her college sweetheart, Stuart Woodward, in 1970, two years after she was kidnapped. They had two children and lived happily married before Stuart died in 2013. For your information, she wrote about her experience when she was kidnapped in a book published in 1971. The book is called 83 Hours Till Dawn, and maybe you should read it if you want to know more about this case from her point of view.